Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video looking at the entirety of topic 4, which is focusing on obtaining and using metals and equilibrium. The aim for this video is to look at all the key things that you need to revise to get yourself ready for the exam. If you want to go into more detail on any particular part, I've put a link in the top right hand corner to the playlist which goes into each section of the video in more detail, including practice questions and the model answers for them. So this is just an overview, if you want more detail, have a look at the playlist in the top right hand corner. The first part of the video then is going to have a look at how we know how reactive a metal is. Now, how do you work out how reactive a metal is? You look at their reactions. And there are three different types of reactions you can look at. The first one being reactions with acids. Now, if you take any metal and react it with an acid, nice and simply, you'll get your salt and you'll get hydrogen gas. Now, when hydrogen is given off, you will see bubbles. Nice and simply, the more bubbles you get, the more reactive a metal is. And from my reactivity series on the left here, you would see the most bubbles with potassium, you'd see some bubbles with magnesium, and you'd see very few, if any, with copper. And then your unreactive ones like gold, you wouldn't see any bubbles at all. The second type of reaction you can look at is with water, and in particular cold water. Now if you take any metal and you react it with water, you will either get a metal hydroxide or a metal oxide, and again you'll get hydrogen gas. Once again, the more bubbles you get, the more reactive it is. Potassium, you're going to see lots of bubbles, but magnesium, you're not going to see any. The reason for that is magnesium isn't reactive enough to react with cold water. So from that, you know that calcium upwards in this reactivity series are my really reactive metals. And then magnesium down to iron are less reactive. And to make those react, you need to actually react it with steam. So you take water, you heat it up, and turn it into a gas. When you do that, you'll form an oxide, in this case magnesium oxide, and then you'll get your hydrogen bubbles. The third type of reaction you can look at is displacement reactions. Now nice and simply here, the more reactive metal is always going to swap places with the less reactive metal to end up as part of the compound. So for example, if I take copper sulfate and react it with magnesium, you can see on the left, magnesium is more reactive than copper. So copper is the least reactive one. The more reactive one wants to be part of the compound, so they will swap around. And you'll end up with magnesium sulfate and then copper left on its own. So the more reactive one will always end up as part of the compound. Usually you'll see a colour change. If you see a colour change, you'll know that it's more reactive. The next part of the video is going to go into a little bit more detail on displacement reactions, and in particular how those displacement reactions show redox, which is reduction and oxidation. Now this is only in the higher section, so if you're not doing the higher paper, you can skip past this and move on to the next part. So if we have a look at the displacement reaction we just talked about, which is copper sulphate reacting with magnesium and forming magnesium sulphate and copper. You can see here I've got my state symbols of aqueous for my solutions, my sulphate and solid for my metals. What you need to be able to do is tell me where oxidation and reduction are occurring in these reactions. Remembering oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So there are a few steps you can follow. The first one, separate out the ions and remove the spectator ions. The spectator ions being the ions that are exactly the same on both sides. So if we have a look at this, we've got copper and we've got sulphate. You should remember sulphate is SO4 2 minus, therefore copper has got to be Cu2 plus because we've only got one of it. Magnesium is a solid, so we don't change that into its iron at the moment. On the right hand side, magnesium is now part of the compound, it is now ionic, it's in group 2, so it becomes Mg2+. Our sulphate doesn't change, so that stays as SO4 2 minus. And then copper has now become the solid, so we put Cu with S in brackets. So as you can see from both sides of this equation, the only things that are the same are our SO4 2 minus ions, our sulphate ions, so we remove them and rewrite it. Step two is to show the change, so the change in charge. So if we start off with copper, that's going from Cu2 plus to Cu. And then magnesium is going from Mg to Mg2 plus. And then number three, what you've got to do is find out how many electrons have been lost or gained. 
Again here, you need to remember if something is positive, it's lost electrons. So copper two plus has no electrons in the outer shell and has lost two electrons. It's going back to a copper atom. If it's Cu2+, plus, it means you've added two electrons on. So therefore, I add electrons, and therefore, that appears on the left-hand side of the arrow. So it's Cu2+, plus, plus 2E- minus goes to Cu. Magnesium, on the other hand, has gone from a normal magnesium atom. It's in group 2, so two electrons in the outer shell, to Mg2+, plus, so a magnesium ion with no electrons there. So what we can say now is copper has gained two electrons, so it has been reduced, and magnesium has lost two electrons, so it has been oxidized. Next section, extracting ores. So what are ores and how can we extract metals from them? So nice and simply, an ore is a rock that contains enough metal to make a profit when you extract it. You've got two types of ore, you've got high grade, which means you'll get lots of profit, and low grade, you'll get little, if any, profit. So we now know that an ore is a rock that contains a metal, and we need to get those metals out of the ground, so how do we do it? First of all, we take our unreactive metals. They are silver and gold. Because they're unreactive, it means they're found uncombined, it means they don't react, so all you have to do is dig them out. So if you're asked, how do you extract silver and gold? You dig them out because they're unreactive, they're found uncombined. The ones that are less reactive than carbon, so that's where this line is here, so zinc, iron, tin, and copper, they have to be reduced or heated with carbon. So it's a displacement reaction. You add carbon in, you heat it, and what will happen is your carbon will react with the oxygen in the ore, leaving you with your metal on its own. Now the benefit of that is it's cheaper than the third way of extracting them, which is electrolysis, which I'll come on to in a minute. So for example, if you take copper oxide, you react it with carbon, it will make copper and carbon dioxide, leaving you with your copper metal. Third way of extracting then, that is for your more reactive metals, the ones that are more reactive than carbon. For these ones, you have to use electrolysis. You can't heat with carbon. The reason for that being is you put it in, potassium, sodium, they're more reactive than carbon, therefore they will not be displaced by the carbon. So for example, with your electrolysis, you take aluminium oxide, you melt it, you turn it into a liquid, you do your electrolysis on it, and you'll end up with aluminium and oxygen. Now it's important to remember, both of these reactions are reduction reactions, where the oxygen is removed. And they're both used for obtaining metals from high-grade ores. When it comes to getting them from low-grade ores, where you're not going to make as much of a profit, there are two different techniques, which are bio-leaching and phyto-extraction, which is what this next part of the video is looking at. Right, let's start off with bio-leaching. Nice and simply, if you're bio-leaching, it means you're using bacteria. The clue is in the name. Now, the main example you need to know is copper sulfide, CUS. When you use bacteria, it will break that down into a copper solution. That solution is called a leachate. Once you have done that, you add scrap iron to that solution and you get a displacement reaction. So you take iron from a junk heap, you use scrap iron, you add it in, and what will happen is your copper will be produced, your copper metal. The benefit to this method is it doesn't produce any harmful gases, it doesn't damage the landscape, and it works at low temperatures, so it'll work pretty much anywhere. However, it takes a long time, it's really slow and it can produce toxic chemicals. So although there are no harmful gases, it can produce toxic chemicals and things like sulfur dioxide. The second way to extract your low-grade ore is phytoextraction. And again, you probably can figure out from the name, that's to do with plants. So what we do is we take a plant, we make it grow, and it will absorb any metals in the soil. When we then burn that plant, the ashes contain the metal. And again, we can use displacement reactions to fully collect that metal. Now the benefits of this, it doesn't produce harmful gases and it doesn't damage the landscape, just like using bioleaching. But it can also get metals from contaminated soil. That's a massive, massive benefit. However, there are downsides again. It's also slow and it's weather dependent. If you haven't got the climate, you can't grow the plants. If you can't grow the plants, you can't get the metal out of the ground. And 
It can also be more expensive than using electrolysis at times, so you have to weigh up the benefits and the consequences of using either method. Next section, recycling. Why do we need to recycle? Now there are several things that you just need to learn and bullet point and write down in the exam. The main one being it conserves Earth's natural resources. It means we're not going to run out of our metals, our oil, if we recycle. The other thing is it doesn't damage the landscape. You're not having to dig out more of the metal or more of the oil, so it's not going to damage the landscape. There are less waste in landfills. You're not throwing stuff in the ground because you're recycling it, so the landfills don't fill up. It takes up less energy than extracting from heating with carbon or from electrolysis. So you're going to save a lot more energy, which means less fossil fuels burned, less oil wasted. And then finally, you're not going to produce as much carbon dioxide. So again, if you're extracting from the ground, that's going to mean you're going to use up a lot of energy. You've got to get that from somewhere. That's our fossil fuels. So it's going to give out CO2. So there are less carbon dioxide emissions when you recycle. Okay, the final part of the metals summary is looking at life cycle assessments. Now there are four stages to a life cycle assessment, which are choice of material, manufacture of product, use of product, and disposal of product. So what you guys have got to do, they'll give you a product and they'll say, which of these two is the best product to use, or which of these is the best choice of material, which of these is the best way of manufacturing them. And there's no easy way to go through this, but just a few pointers for you. If we talk about choice of material, if you've got one that's renewable, that's the one you want to go for. How much energy or pollution is it going to produce? The one with the least, that's the one you're going to go for. Manufacture of product. How much energy to refine it or to make the actual product? The one with the least, that's going to be the best. How far do you have to transport the materials? If it's a long way, that's going to use up fossil fuels again, so that's going to be a bad thing. So you're going to go for the one that's nearest. And is the energy source renewable? Are you using solar power to do it? If you're using that, that's your advantage, so you'd use that manufacturing technique. Use of product, is it toxic? Is there one that's toxic, one that isn't? You go with the one that's not toxic. Will it produce any dangerous gases when used? And how long will it last for? If one's going to be a one use and done, and the other one's going to last for a long time, you're probably going to want the one that's going to last for a long time. And then disposable, is it recyclable? If it's recyclable, that's a massive advantage. Does it give off toxic chemicals when you bury them in landfills or when you burn them? Again, if it does that, that's a bad thing. So it's about weighing up the pros and cons of all the different ones, choosing the one that you think is best and explaining why. Right, the next section of this video is looking at reversible reactions and equilibrium. So we're going to start off with reversible reactions and what a reversible reaction is. So the best way to do that is look at the most common reaction, which is nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to produce ammonia. This is called the Haber process. So I've got N2 reacting with H2 to make NH3. And as you can see, to balance it, I need two ammonias and three hydrogens. Now, when nitrogen reacts with hydrogen to make ammonia, ammonia at the same time is breaking back down into nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, if we were to write this, it's going to take a long time, so there's an easier way. So if you have a reaction where both the forward and the backward reactions are occurring, we can put a reversible sign in, and that's what this is here. So now you know what a reversible reaction is, we need to know what dynamic equilibrium is. So the best way to do that is to have a look at this graph here. This graph shows the percentage of my reactants, which is going down, and the percentage of my products, which is going up. Now, you can see at this point here, it's leveled off, it's become flat. At this point, both the forward and backwards reactions are occurring, now they're occurring at the same time, but the percentage of my reactants and products is staying the same. That's what dynamic equilibrium is. So the dynamic part means both reactions are still occurring, so in the one we just talked about, ammonia is breaking down into nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen and hydrogen are reacting to make ammonia. The equilibrium part means that 
the actual percentage, the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen and the amount of ammonia is staying exactly the same. Now this must be in a closed environment. So basically, no gases should be allowed to escape or enter. The final section of this video is going to look at how the different factors affect the equilibrium. So the yield, the amount of ammonia produced in the harbour process. So we're going to start off with the main one, which is temperature. Now, if you change the temperature in a reversible reaction, there are two different types of reaction. There's an endothermic and an exothermic part. For the harbour process, the forward reaction is exothermic and the backwards reaction is endothermic. Now, the important thing to remember is that if you increase the temperature, it favours the endothermic reaction. So here, it's going to favour the backwards reaction. If that happens, the equilibrium will shift to the left, and that means I'm going to get less ammonia and more nitrogen and hydrogen. So that's a bad thing. So therefore, you'd think, right, we decrease the temperature, because that favours the exothermic, I'm going to get more ammonia. However, if you do that, it's much, much slower. So what we do is we go for 450 degrees, and that's the temperature you need to remember for the harbour process. The reason we use 450 degrees is because it's a compromise between speed of producing it and yield. The second main condition is increasing the pressure. Now, if you increase the pressure, it will always favour the side with the least molecules. So what you need to be able to do is look at any reaction and work out how many molecules you have on the left and on the right. So on the left here, I've got one nitrogen molecule and I've got three hydrogen molecules. So in total, I have four molecules on the left. On the right, I have two molecules. So my least molecules is on the right. So if I increase the pressure, I will have equilibrium shifting to the right and therefore I'm going to have more ammonia. So that's a good thing. However, if you increase the pressure, it increases the cost. You've got to be able to have a container that's strong enough to go to that pressure and that costs a lot of money. So what we do is we go with 200 atmospheres and again, that's a compromise between cost and yield. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel. You can check out the latest video and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.